Good afternoon, everybody, uh, both here and uh, online if you're watching from home. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan. I'm a curator with the Albright Knox Art Gallery, and I'm very happy to be here this evening to, uh, or this, sorry, this afternoon, not evening yet, <laughs> to, um, to moderate this panel. Uh, first of all, I feel like I need to apologize. I know that I am in Montreal, but uh, I will be presenting in English, as will um, Jean Gagnon and Anne Spalter here with me today. Uh, J'ai étudié le français pendant uh, six ans à l'école, mais j'ai tout oublié. So um, we are going to be in English. I uh, would like to reiterate Stephen's thanks and to thank uh, Agak and Papier for inviting us to be here today, and also the Albright Knox Contemporary and Modern Art Foundation Canada, who are represented uh, here today by Pamela Dinsmore and Francois Rochon. So wherever you are, thank you so much uh, for supporting this panel today. I, uh, I am a specialist in the new media arts, working mostly in video and digital. So um, some of you might wonder what I am doing here today at an art fair devoted to paper. It's an excellent question. Uh, and the answer is that actually the history of new media art, the history of digital art is very much um, tied to paper as a material, as a medium. So I know that many of you here today, I'm assuming most of you here today, have an interest in paper, in artworks on paper. So I'm not sure if you're already familiar with any of this history, but if you're not, then hopefully today will be a wonderful, uh, if very brief, introduction to this history. In the, uh, the mid-1960s, computers were mostly really only accessible to researchers working at uh, universities, corporations, military institutes. And at this moment, these researchers began really um, working in a very uh, dedicated manner towards developing new software and hardware technologies for computer graphics. So in other words, this is the moment in the 1960s when the computer uh, stops being merely a, a, a tool for calculation and actually becomes a visual media technology. A lot of the researchers at these institutes who are working with computers began to uh, look at the graphics that they were making and, and to think that perhaps they had some aesthetic interest. So on the screen here, you see a work by a, a researcher named A. Michael Knoll, who was then employed by the communications company Bell Labs. And Knoll was particularly interested in um, thinking about the relationship between some of these images that he was making that were generated by algorithms using the computer and the geomet geometric abstraction of the contemporary uh, op artists. So he actually said that this work of his on the left was a deliberate response to the work of Bridget Riley. And you see on the right, the painting called Current from 1964. So these are works from the same year. And now, of course, Current is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, and yet, A. Michael Knoll's work is not nearly as familiar to us uh, as Bridget Riley. So one of the goals of the panel today is to introduce to you some of these artists who were making works on paper that aesthetically are quite similar in terms of their formal composition, but actually were made using uh, not you know paint, uh, uh, but computer-generated uh, drawings and, and images that were photographed. Along with his colleague, Bella Hulez, Noel presented his works uh, in the first exhibition of computer-generated works in America in 1965 at the Howard Wise Gallery in New York City. It was an exhibition called Computer-Generated Pictures. And, uh, that title actually was very specifically chosen. They didn't want to call it computer-generated art because neither um, uh, Noel or Hulez could agree on whether these works were really works of art. So they figured pictures was a more neutral term. Um, so this is a, in, two installation photographs of that show. So th as I mentioned, this is the first exhibition of computer-generated images in an artistic setting in an art gallery in America. A few uh, weeks before, there was another show in Germany that happened uh, that technically is the first to happen anywhere. While Noel and Hulez were very interested in using uh, uh, computers to make abstract works of art, there were other artists like Leon Harmon and Kenneth Knowlton who were interested in figuration. And they worked on a process uh, that allowed them to digitally scan photographs and then transform those images into uh, images made up of tiny symbols, of tiny computer graphics. 
and that gave rise to the field that we call ASCII art. So you might be familiar with what this looks like without knowing um, what the name is. And for those of you who use social media or on Twitter, if you ever see like a drawing of a man that's made up of hyphens and dashes and colons, that's an example of ASCII art. So they were transforming photographs into these kinds of images, and then they were um, printing them out. Now I mentioned printing. So the problem is at this moment in time in the mid-1960s, these artists are making these images, but how do they share them? This is a moment in which most people do not have access to computers, so I can't simply give it to you on a storage medium because you don't have a computer unless you are a researcher or a scientist working in one of these institutes. And of course, computers at this time, you know, they're the size of rooms. Um, the other problem is there, that there's really no way to send them on the internet either. You'd have to physically uh, give them, you know, give the images to somebody on a physical uh, storage medium. So since you can't you know, sort of send them, and since there's nobody to send them to because so few people have computers, these digital images need to get output as physical objects in the world in order to be shown, in order to be shared. So this is a very different moment from the moment we have now where you can have an artist who makes works of art digitally and circulates them online, right? So they have to become physical. And this is where paper comes into the story. Now there are two ways for artists to uh, basically output a digital image onto paper at this moment in time. One is to output the image to a, a monitor, basically like a television monitor, and then photograph the screen of the monitor. And then they print that photograph on a piece of paper just like any other photograph. So a lot of the time when you're collecting work from this period, what you're collecting is basically photography, actually. The other way to output digital images the other primary way, was uh, by printing them using uh, one of the early examples of digital printers, including machines that were called, uh, called plotter machines or plotter printers. So you see an example here of a plotter printer. This is a work by Rafael Lozano Hemmer, a Mexican-Canadian artist who is based here, actually in Montreal. Um, he is having a major exhibition open up at the MAC next month, so I will actually be back in just a couple weeks to come to the opening for that. Uh, so Raphael is really a historian of new media art, and this work is a kind of homage to this early moment uh, in uh, digital art when artists were using these machines basically to make drawings. So the computer controls uh, the arm of this uh, plotting machine, the printer, and that arm is loaded with uh, basically like a pen that can be filled with any kind of uh, traditional medium, like for example, India ink. And then it moves over the surface of the paper to make the drawing. It's a similar technology if you've ever seen a seismograph, the machines that record earthquakes uh, and, and the movement of the earth. So it's the same idea. It's a machine that controls this pen to, to make this drawing. And these can be one-off unique drawings or they can be repeated drawings either way. So as a historian of media art myself, uh, very much like Raphael, I'm very interested in how artists used paper at this early moment in digital art. Because we are now at this much later moment in digital art when we are struggling to think, what does digital art even mean? And I like returning to this earlier moment because it reminds us that digital art is not just art that is made or exhibited on a computer. It's not just something that you encounter in virtual reality. It's not just a website uh, on the internet. It actually can be something that uh, is, is manifested in other materials. Um, maybe it's even possible for painting to be an example of digital art. And especially in this moment in time when almost all artists are using digital images or digital um, you know, processes, maybe they're doing research on Google, what does it even mean to be a digital artist? Right? So if we go back to this early moment in the 60s, we realize that digital art has always been about jumping over these boundaries between mediums. Right? So on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Anne Spalter. So Anne Spalter is um, a digital artist herself and also a collector of this material that I've been introducing you to. So Anne is going to talk more about her own collection and talk a little bit more about the specificity of the paper um, in these works. So thank you. Thank you, Tina, and um, it's awesome to be here at Papier, and thanks Pamela and Francoise and everyone for uh, making this panel possible. And I wanted to begin actually by finding out if anyone here, does anyone here collect any digital artwork? Did you hear it? Okay, great, so, oh, one person, awesome. Is anyone here skeptical about 
the whole field of digital artwork. You don't even have to raise your hand, because you can just think in your mind, because I'm going to tell a short story before I show some images about uh, my journey from complete skeptic to true believer. I, um, I was an art student and studied painting, drawing, loved it, and then my parents stopped sending me money and I had to get a job, sadly, and I was in a little cubicle working on my computer and I had no time to make my art, and the only way I could make images was on my computer. So I began to experiment with that, and I still didn't think it was art. I was really convinced that the computer had no role in art making, there was something wrong with it, art had to be made with your hands. So I, I didn't buy into it, even as I was spending more and more time at my job making imagery instead of working, and my boss would come by and I'd click on Excel. I was working at a bank. So after a while I realized banking probably wasn't for me, and I applied to graduate school and went back to study painting. So I came back, I thought I'm never using the computer again, and uh, stretched up a big canvas, and I did something that I regretted, and I thought, in my mind, I thought, like, undo, it's gonna go away. Of course, nothing happened. So I thought, oh, maybe there's something to this computer. And I realized that the computer is an amazingly powerful visual thinking tool. So I wanted to integrate it more with my art making, but there weren't really any classes to do that. And as you'll see, I think with the discussion and some of the things I'll show, there was really outright hostility to the whole idea. So I could understand that because I had felt it only literally months before. And when I put computer, for, no one would look at an image on the screen. You know, that was like, couldn't do it at all. If I printed something out and the, the paper in a, you know, office kind of printer, it looks horrible. So I think partially for that reason, no one wanted to see that either. And I couldn't get any critique on any work I had done on the computer. And even printing something and using it in a collage. I had critics come from New York. I was at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, which is near New York. I had um, critics come who refused to look at my work because I'd used the computer. They didn't even see it and say, oh, I don't like it. They just wouldn't even look at it. I was very frustrated. And um, so, and this is a, a short example of something that I think brings up some issues that are relevant to everything I'm about to show in the images. I had my own laser printer, which was my prized possession. There, at the time, were only dot matrix printers, which looked particularly horrible for making nice images. There weren't inkjet printers at that time. And I forced a piece of BFK paper through my laser printer at home. After several tries, came out covered with toner, sprayed a whole bunch of fixative on it, put it up on the wall, and I said it was an etching. And I got a great critique on it. And at the end, I said, oh, by the way, computer piece. And the level of rage was unanticipated. So I think that brings up three points that I want to discuss. One is that some of the issues of looking at computer work on paper are perceptual and conceptual, the, the way the work has been received in the art world. It doesn't have to do with what the image looks like, but just the fact that a computer was involved. And another one is that when you make an image in the computer, it can really be manifested in a lot of different ways. So sort of like action painting, you know, they felt that the paintings were just sort of one example of something that could sort of emerge out at any time. So you can have a video, you can have a screen, a projection, a 3D printed object, or a work on paper. And the third one is, and I've been thinking about this in preparation for coming here, I think that paper is a particularly interesting intersection of the digital, virtual, creation in the real world. Um, it's a beautiful way to manifest things and it brings together the sort of ancient technology and super modern technology in a way that's very provocative and I think needs some more exploration than it's gotten. So I ended up actually teaching the first computer fine art courses at the Rhode Island School of Design and Brown and looking for resources. I didn't find what I needed. I ended up writing a book on it and through that, met many of the pioneers of the field. My husband was an art history major, and he said, wow, these people are all making art, like Tina said. They all know each other, they're showing, they're making art, and the art world hates them. So he said, what is this like? It's like every movement in art history ever. The academy doesn't like them, they all know what they're doing, they discuss it amongst themselves, but they're having trouble getting the message out. We should be supporting them and writing about it. And we began to acquire some pieces here and there, and it has turned into one of the largest private collections of early computer artwork, 
which now I'm going to show you some. That's my preamble. Um, did they, is this the first one now, or should I click this backward? One. This is the first one for you. They didn't get reorganized. They did. They stayed reorganized. No. I'm going to start with this one. OK. <laughs> um, hold on one second. I should see. These. OK. Um, when we started collecting them, we told our daughter, um, you know, keep all this weird line drawings that you see up on the third floor because sometimes maybe your children or their children ever, it might be a value to them. And, but we don't know. But don't throw these out. And um, she's like, okay, okay, mom, dad. Uh, so we've been actually very uh, delightfully surprised to find that there is now real interest in this and people wanting to know just like people want to know who the first photographers were, who were the pioneers of this field. And one of my favorite artists, um, we were fortunate to be able to include her work in a show that's up at the Museum of Modern Art. It actually just came down last week. And we had five pieces in there. Her name is Vera Molnar. And she worked on a bunch of different types of paper. So I want to show some of those to you. Um, actually, you're going to see that later. But one of them, which was in that case, and this one, is an example of paper that's continuous feed. So it's in a huge stack, and it has little sprockets along the side, which we're going to see a blow up of later on. But one of the advantages of it, let's go back, is that you can display it in m many different ways. So if you see that long display case, you can show a scroll, um, you can make a long book, or have this cascade of work. And this is Manfred Moore, another artist who um, is German who lives in New York and has been exploring ways of picturing the cube, started before Soloit, but has not had the same reception because he's been using the computer. Um, Jean-Pierre Hébert, who's French but lives in California, has experimented with all kinds of paper. And one of the advantages of the plotter that Tina showed is that um, Unlike most of the printers that you see today, because it's just a flat thing and the arm moves around, you can put all kinds of paper on it pretty easily and experiment. So this is a graphite plotter, and he put mylar in it. And it creates this beautiful, transparent feeling thing within the pencil drawing on it. And he uses equations from physics. He's actually an artist in residence at a, a physics research, research center. This is one of the first computer art pieces. It's a photograph from a screen of an oscilloscope. And it's actually from the 50s. Yeah, 1954, I don't know if it's written on there. 52, as you can see up there. Um, and so it's not a digital piece. And I think if it had been shown as a photograph and included in the genre of photography, we might not have seen it, might not have been able to afford to purchase it. But because it was shown in a computer art show, people ignored it. But I think it's a very beautiful work. And we were able to get a bunch of them because no one was interested. So it's been fascinating. This, we were driving down a highway in Fort Lauderdale and saw an enormous billboard for the Salvador Dali Museum. It said, Salvador Dali, genius or madman? Of course, we had to turn off the highway, find out. <laughs> and there was a show of Dali paintings paired with work of the conceptual artist, Juan Fonquiberta, who's actually very well known. And he had done these very large, um, their photographs, but this is about five feet across at least. There are sea prints mounted on aluminum. So the material is all traditional material, but the imagery was created with a 3D program that makes landscapes. So the landscape is fictional and it's meant to imitate the composition that Salvador Dali worked on. And again, I think seeing his work in a regular gallery show, it would have been definitely out of our range as collectors, but in this context and as computer art, no one was interested. And now we own this super piece. So here you can see this paper with the little sprockets, like a film, like a piece of film along the top. And it had a little plastic wheel for these printers that rolled it through. And a lot of early computer art was made on this. The paper quality itself is not so great. But you could create these long works. So this is Jean-Pierre um, Jean Hébert again. It was some rice paper. He worked with all different types of rice paper. And just to show um, some of the difference between those old printers and the inkjet printers of today, this is by Mark Wilson. 
And this is a plotter print, so it's kind of hard to tell from a slide, but the way the plotter works, like a big etch-a-sketch, the lines physically go over each other. So the pen draws, it goes back, it draws again, it goes back, it draws again. So you get that physics of the optics of light going through the layers of ink and coming back out at you. And it's a pain using the plotter. So Jean-Pierre said with some of his huge pieces, he literally stayed awake for over 24 hours watching it plot because if the pen stops or something happens, you have to be there to monitor it. So it was a very actually sort of physically and time intensive process to make large pieces. So now most artists use an inkjet printer, which has beautiful colors, and you can do photorealistic things, which you can't make just with a line, because it makes little halftone dots. <coughs> but each thing, even though it looks like stuff is overlapping, it's not overlapping, which when you're seeing them in person, I think there is an interesting optical difference. And in the beginning, it was not as archival, although now the inks are very archival. And just a, one quick slide on my work. I don't know if we have time now to show the video. Maybe we'll do that at the end. Um, I mostly work in video, digital video, and I travel to different places and shoot my own um, moving and still images. And then recently I've been trying to find kind of still, not just frames taken out of the video, but ways of representing the content of the video with still images printed on large pieces of paper from a big inkjet printer. So you can um, go to the video link. All this is going to be on the website. If we have time to see it later or you want to stay after, we could show it. But these are some of the still images from the video. Called Great. Beacon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anne. Um, so now I just want to introduce Jean Gagnon really briefly. So he is a, a Montreal-based curator and critic and also the former director of the Fondation Jean Lang uh, Daniel Langlois, um, which is, if you're not aware of it, it's a very important organization dedicated to the history of new media art, art and technology. So. Merci, Tina. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, je vais parler en anglais de sorte qu'on puisse uh, tous se comprendre, mais évidemment, vous pourrez, uh, s'il y a des questions, uh, les poser en français. Uh, when I got the invitation, I thought it was the best uh, opportunity for me to present uh, the work of Sonia Landy Sheridan. There she is. She's still alive, 93. She turned 93 last week on uh, April, uh, April 10th. And uh, she's uh, quite active on Facebook. She, uh, if you search for Sonia uh, Sheridan, you'll find her on Facebook. Um, the uh, Sonia Sheridan archive is housed here in Montreal at the Cinematheque Québécoise. Um, <clears throat> she is a pioneer of technological and industrial processes, of the use of technological and industrial processes in the visual arts. Uh, as an art and educator, she guided her students to explore and experiment with new communication tools, such as photocopier, telecopier, computer graphics, etc. The Daniel Langlois Foundation acquired the uh, Sonia Sheridan, Landy Sheridan Fund in uh, April 2005, and it was transferred in 2011 to the Cinematic Québécoise uh, with the rest of the uh, foundation's holding, which is now at the Cinematic Québécoise. In actual fact, anyone who wants to uh, study uh, this amazing artist um, would have to travel between Montreal and Hanover, New Hampshire, because um, the Museum of Art at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, has acquired about 684 works by uh, Sonia Sheridan. Uh, mostly uh, drawings and, and uh, paintings, and a few examples of works done with um, different equipment uh, and machines. While the um, font in Montreal is mostly archival, uh, 20 meters of textual and other documents, and among the other documents, there's a lot of uh, printout of her um, works with the uh, photocopier. This is a work in the um, um, ink on paper in the Wood Museum of Art in uh, Hanover. 
that's an example of the work she would do with her students in the 70s. Uh, as you can see, she would um, use this lady's body as subject for a photocopy work. And the process is called Color in Color 2, uh, which was a process by 3M, the company 3M. Just a few um, uh, dates about Sonia uh, Sheridan. She was born in 25, and she married uh, in 47 uh, James E. Sheridan. So her, her maiden name is Sonia Landy. Um, from uh, 1941 to 45, she studied visual arts at Hunter College in New York, where she earned a bachelor degree in uh, 45. Between 46 and 47, she did graduate studies at Columbia University. In 48, 49, she also pursued graduate work at the University uh, of Illinois. In 52, she studied at San Jose College in California. In 57, during a visit to Taiwan with her husband, she attended National Taiwan Normal University. In 61, she completed a master's degree in fine arts uh, at the California College of Art and Crafts uh, in Auckland. Um, between 60 and 61, Sheridan was successively instructor at uh, the California College of Arts and Crafts and professor at the Art Institute of, Ch of Chicago. She went, went on to become uh, an assistant professor um, and an assistant, associate professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she taught mainly courses in drawing and print, printmaking. In 70, 76, she became full professor there. It's in the early 60s uh, that she became interested in the use of communication technology in art and began to establish professional contacts with industry. From 69 until the mid 70s, Sheridan was artist in residence at 3M. So she was one of the first artists to actually be a resident researcher uh, in uh, an industrial uh, lab in, with the company 3M. And uh, since then, we've, we've seen many of those artist residencies being established at different companies, among others, Xerox in the US. Uh, she experimented uh, with various imaging systems, such as color reprography. At her request, the Art Institute of Chicago initi initially rented even a, and eventually acquired the 3M CNC thermal process color photocopier. At the Insti uh, Art Institute of Chicago, she created a program that she called uh, gener um, Generative Systems in 1970. Here on the picture, you, we see different type of equipment, um, different type of photocopiers, uh, telecopiers. Uh, we see a, f a, f a phone there, so it was probably uh, for experimentation with the first few uh, you know, telecopier or fax machines in those days. And the uh, piece of equipment that I uh, surrounded in red is um, a 3M machine that allowed to read sound page. So we have an example uh, of a, what looked uh, like a sound page. So on one side you had a Paper, you could draw on the paper. On the other side, you had uh, co it was coated with uh, material to record sound. So she used it uh, when uh, she had invited the artist in her classes. So she would record the, the uh, people uh, speaking, and on the side of the paper, she would um, draw or take notes. This is the reader of the sound page, which is in Montreal in the collection. 
Actually, I've never seen such a such a machine. So when we opened the box and saw this, we uh, at first thought, well, uh, what is it for? Um, just uh, this is an example of what she uh, used to do with um, uh, Xerox or photocopier. Uh, she did also a lot of floral motifs, but she also did a lot of work back and forth between works with the machines and work by hand. Uh, just to finish, um, she um, said one thing that I think that is very important to consider when we look at these works using technologies, <clears throat> she said, I wanted to go through the machine and out, always coming back to the end. So in a way, she uh, was always uh, going back, back and forth, uh, doing work with those machines, which were a bit, um, you know, um, object, objectifying uh, uh, the subjects she was treating through a mechanism and she felt the need to go back to end drawings like this one which has a very in interesting title Imagination is only one person Rhythm is all um, and I find it very uh, beautiful actually <laughs> so I think I'll, I'll just uh, stop there and maybe do I have other pictures yeah um, one thing also she said is that technology allowed um, her to work through time. So a lot of those technologies also um, um, induce a, a time aspect to the creation of images. Uh, obviously we know that through photography and cinema, but uh, she also experimented uh, this uh, aspect with photocopier. And this one is called uh, Sonia Through Time. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to end with Sonia Through Time because, of course, now, even though she's still with us, you've, you've brought Sonia through time, all of her work from the 70s and onwards and into the present. Uh, so I wanted to um, start with just a few questions for Jean and Anne, and then we'll open it up to the audience, and I'm hoping that you guys have some good questions too. I would love to hear them. So I wanted to begin with some very practical questions, given that this is an art fair, and that we're all here to, uh, to uh, acquire, to sell, or at least to learn about uh, works on paper. So how do you find these works, right? This is the number one challenge, I think, with this material, because uh, for so many artists who work on paper, they are represented by major galleries, they're sold to major institutions, to museums, to private collections, and there are catalog resumes. So it's pretty easy to track down the work, right? You can, you can go to the gallery, you can go to a museum's website, um, but so much of this material, because, as Anne mentioned, it wasn't really collected, um, and because it wasn't exhibited by galleries, that first exhibition I showed you from 1965, of course, was totally anomalous, and it would take decades before computer art was shown in major New York galleries, again, uh, for the most part. So, so given that this work is not really collected, exhibited, um, it's just not available, as a collector, um, as a researcher, where do you go to find this stuff? Uh, maybe I, I could just say why the Landla Foundation started that kind of work, meaning collecting uh, mostly archives, not so much works of art, but archives from people who had used uh, technologies, video, um, computers, and so on, in making artworks. Um, we started this in the um, late 90s, 99 actually. We uh, acquired the first um, archive from the Vesulkas, uh, Stena and Woody Vesulkas, who were um, a pioneer of video art. And we uh, did that because I knew before being at the Landra Foundation, I was curator of media arts at the National Gallery of Canada in the 90s. 
And I knew from that experience that where do you go if you want to study uh, even video art in those days, you know? Where, where were the archives? Where were the information, the material, and so on? Um, and it was all dispersed very, most of the time in the hands of the artists. So when I got to the Landa Foundation, I decided I would create uh, what we, we call the Center for Research and Documentation, and we would ar acquire mostly archives so that the, that kind of work be documented. So we acquired these things from the artists, uh, and that's how we... So, so basically you have to go straight to the source. Right? And that's, yeah. I found that in my experience as well as a researcher is that oftentimes it's the artists themselves who have maintained their archives. And of course, the, the great impending tragedy is that most of the artists of this generation are beginning to pass away. So for example, A. Michael Knoll is still with us. He lives in New Jersey. He has an incredible archive. He made his own website where he puts his materials online. So usually it's a matter of going to these artists, but my concern is that we're not doing, you know, museums, nonprofit organizations, we're not doing this work fast enough. Um, and so if we don't get to these artists and make sure that their archives are being taken care of um, for the future, then I worry what's going to happen to this history. Yeah. Well, it's great that you're working at one of these institutions. Like, look at this now. But I'd say what is nice is that there are now galleries devoted to this subject matter. So the Bitforms Gallery in New York, the Digital Art Museum Gallery in Berlin, that show almost exclusively um, digital new media artists. And also, just because of the internet, you can look, you can put anyone's name into Artsy that I showed in my slide presentation, pretty much, and see work by them. And then you can go back and see which galleries are representing them. You know, an artist like Vera Molnar actually has several galleries representing her. So you can sort of follow the threads. And what's wonderful for us as collectors now is seeing, first, having some galleries devoted to it was fantastic and then seeing a show like the one that was up at the Museum of Modern Art in New York where the artwork was just in a show with regular art and not actually separated out into a separate other sort of you know ghettoized special projects room type of setting and just have it be part of the regular art discussion art canon so it's often grouped as it was done with um, systems art because the art is made with algorithms so it's a rule art according to rules, there actually is a long history of that mm -hmm. in traditional you know, art history and art theory. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point that actually now there are more and more galleries. You mentioned Bitforms, also uh, the Transfer Gallery, also in New York. There are more and more galleries that are specializing in this material. Um, but at the same time, there's also a move where this material is being absorbed into the larger discourse of art history. So as you mentioned, the fact that now it's being exhibited not only in places like um, ZKM, for example, in, in Germany, uh, or at Ars Electronica, these festivals, these institutions that are explicitly dedicated to supporting new media art. Now we're seeing digital tools being used by artists who are exhibiting at the Whitney <laughs> um, or you know, at MoMA. So there is this integration that's happening and I think the tension moving forward is going to be um, how to uh, look at this work and evaluate its aesthetic merits um, as sort of a, a peer, as an equal to work made with other media that are not technological, um, while also understanding the specificity of the technology. Because so many artists who work with this material, it's very important to them that it is made, not by hand, but with a plotter machine, for example. So it's not really fair to just put a handmade drawing and a plotter machine drawing next to each other and judge them without considering how it was made. Because of course, as is the case with so many artists working with all medium, the process is incredibly important. Um, so speaking of exhibitions, uh, I mean, what do you think is the future for this kind of work? Um, are there any uh, exhibitions you're looking forward to? Um, I know Anne, uh, you and Michael have begun lending your collection, it seems, uh, with increasing frequency. So there's these shows that are happening now more and more over the world. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, it's been wonderful to see major museums planning shows that incorporate many early computer artists in the shows. So there's actually been, we just um, lent work to a show in Venice of five early computer artists curated by um, Francesca Franco that was right in Piazza San Marco. It was really incredible seeing 
there's a great connection with the Renaissance and then computer art, because I think there's a connection there. Um, the show at MoMA and LACMA has been working um, on a show that will not be for a few years, but is quite major, incorporating early computer art. So there are several things in the pipeline in significant institutions. Great. So, Jean, do you have? Well, just to say that uh, among the collection of the Landlois Foundation, Sonia Sheridan has uh, had um, a, a good deal of interest uh, from uh, young curators. Um, strangely enough, they, uh, in recent years, they came from uh, Denmark, Sweden, places like, like that, Northern Europe. And uh, another collection <coughs> in the Landlois Foundation's uh, holding which is uh, the Nine Evenings of Theatre and Engineering collection, has also been quite uh, researched uh, by uh, curators and exhibitors. Uh, it, some of it, uh, some material was in, included in, the, um, how was it called, at the Serpentine Gallery uh, Superhighway? Electronic Superhighway, yeah. curated uh, by Omar Khalif. Yeah. So some, some of it was uh, included in, in that exhibition. So the, there has been in recent years, uh, you know, an increasing um, uh, interest in that history. Yeah, actually I forgot to mention also the um, Bell Technology Center at UC Irving just did a huge show of art and technology called Drawing from Code, which we lent several pieces. Yeah, great. So yeah, and Drawing from Code, did that exhibition include, I don't know if you would know the answer, but did it include only works made with the assistance of computers, or was it also based on algorithmic and logical art? No, it had art? some algorithmic things as well, and it had yeah. also musical scores, and it was really fascinating. Oh. Yeah. So See, and it had the Ken Knowlton piece. And right. See, I think that's a great avenue forward for yeah. this kind of work, is thinking about the relationship, how the process of coding uh, a work of art is something that can be done with a computer or not with a computer. Um, there, you know, conceptual art also involves, for example, using codes and um, you know, programming works of art in, in its own way. So. And interestingly, many of the artists that we collect began making their artwork by hand and then discovered the computer and said, oh, now I could do this so much faster and so much better because I can automate this yeah. process. But Manfred Moore, Vera, many of them, you can see their handwritten um, steps that they were taking and, and their handmade drawings that look actually exactly the same as the computer done ones. But then the way I like to think of it is sort of like they were walking and then they realized they could get in a car or an airplane and just <laughs> explore other territory that they would never reach drawing each line by hand. So at this point, we've got a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions for any of us? Yeah, okay. Do we need a microphone, Stephen, or can we? It's, it's going to the, the entire World Wide Web, so we want the whole universe to hear your question. There's no pressure. Yeah. Tina, you referred to a, a show in Berlin in 65 or 64 that preceded the one in New York. What were the Europeans doing at the same time versus yeah. the US? Yeah, so it was 65, actually, not 64. Um, and it wasn't in a traditional art gallery space. Um, so it was more of like an industrial space. Um, so th the Europeans and the Americans weren't really aware of each other at this moment in time. There wasn't a correspondence yet, really. Um, there uh, were many centers, especially in Eastern Europe, where artists who were using new technologies, computer technologies, were really at the avant-garde of thinking about the artistic applications of these technologies. So um, there um, is a great book from MIT Press on the history of, um, what's it called, Bit International? Called new Technologies. No, no, the other book. I'm going to blank out right now. It's a wonderful time for my brain to just fall out of my head. Um, It'll come to me later and New I'll tell tendencies. you. New tendencies. New tendencies, thank you. New tendencies. Um, so yeah, so MIT has a great volume about the history of um, New Tendencies, which is a sort of international group that manifested um, in multiple places and centers. Um, there's a long history of art and technology in Europe, going back you know, to the zero group. I mean, really going back to the futurists. One can write that story. But in terms of these new sort of digital technologies, um, you know, that started emerging in the 60s, a lot of centers 
Um, I'm not necessarily answering your question, but they were all interested in trying to figure out how to make the computer a, a graphics machine, how to generate these images, and basically they were using math. These are all, you know, not all, but many of them are math-based. So they're basically writing equations, um, you know, that would generate these curves, these sine graphs, for example, um, and that's how you generate these works of art. Um, and sometimes, you know, they didn't, uh, or originally they didn't necessarily deliberately set out to make works of art. They were simply doing math and doing their work, and then they realized that the results actually had a kind of aesthetic interest. And so a great question that I think hasn't been settled and that needs to be addressed moving forward is, you know, what does it mean to decide that a mathematical formula can be expressed in a way that's artistically interesting? And what are the aesthetics of math? And how do they compare against, you know, uh, for example, geometric abstraction? I think it's especially in Germany also, there's a very influential figure for the early algorithm and computer artist named Max Benz, who's a philosopher and mathematician, and he wanted to develop ways of ensuring that a work had aesthetic properties. And many of the artists were influenced by that and incorporated his theories algorithmically into their work. Uh, where do you think the future of modern art lies? Do you think computers are still uh, still going to be an important part of the art of tomorrow? Are they going to plateau? I guess this one goes out to the three of you. That's a great question. It's a little open-ended. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting, I'll answer sort of one part of that, which is something that I've been thinking about um, more and more. Max Benz would have liked this. More processes, as you probably know, are auto automated based on algorithms, as you've seen maybe with our news cycle in the US. So um, it is conceivably possible that a computer will literally make art, that you can feed it many examples of previous art and rules for making art, and that it could make art. And it could even make art, say, that's better <coughs> than art that people are making. So, you know, personally, I don't know how I feel about that, but it's something that is being explored in research groups and universities, um, how far algorithmic assistance can really take the art making process. And it's interesting philosophically to help people explore, I think, what art even is. So I think there's some, there's some interesting roles for computation in the future of art and aesthetics. So Anne, you're talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yeah, and machine and, learning. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, the artist Trevor Paglin recently had a show at Metro Pictures that dealt with this question of, you know, what does it look like for a computer to make images? Um, and if you feed the computer a bunch of images, say, of the human body, and say, draw or imagine a human body, the computer right now at this point is producing these very um, uncanny, kind of unsettling ghost-like images of the human body. It's the human body as the machine sees it as a sort of statistical average, um, but also trying to imagine new ways building off of that through AI. Um, so when she's talking about the computer will make art, basically we're trying to come up with ways for artificial intelligence, for, for software programs to be creative. But of course, this begs many questions. What do we mean by creativity? What do we mean by intelligence? And what do we mean by art? I mean, what do we expect out of an aesthetic object? And you know, the history of modernism is, is littered with artists who refuse the idea that art must be handmade, that art must be original. Um, that's sort of the history of the avant-garde in many ways, ironically. So um, I, basically, the history of modernism is that it's going to continue to ask, I think, in many ways, the same questions we've been asking now for over 100 years. Um. I have a question regarding the uh, preservation of this uh, digital art. Y you talk about it with like printing on paper, but what about the work that are still on computer or the process, the algorithm? Uh, what, what are the, um, the new uh, ways to preserve uh, this process? That's a <clears throat> big, big question. <laughs> and there's a lot of um, research going on, um, you know, in Europe and here and in the States about <clears throat> how to go about preserving these things. And what do you preserve? Uh, if you preserve a work on paper, Maybe you preserve the work on paper like you do with traditional, and you forget about the Pascal code uh, that was <laughs> used in the 60s to, to you know, produce it. Mm -hmm. But in the other type of uh, digital 
art, interactive works, uh, interactive installations. Uh, the work of Raphael Lozano-Emer would be a good example. How do we preserve this work without preserving the codes? And I know for a fact, because I, I did work with Raphael um, uh, uh, quite a bit, that even for himself, preserving his own code for future use uh, or future iteration of his work is a big, big issue. Okay, because codes have been written, say, 10 years ago, ran on such a computer, and nowadays it doesn't run at all on the present-day computers. We all know that because we all have that kind of problem when we change computers. So uh, it's a real big issue, and I don't think uh, there is yet uh, the answer. Uh, it's a very, very big issue, and it's very complex. So I'm not sure if you work at all with digital art, but um, this is, as Jean mentioned, it's a huge issue right now. We call this field time-based media art conservation. Um, uh, there has been a number of there are a number of museums who've been at the forefront of thinking about what it means to conserve work that is variable, that is time-based, that is digital. Um, Pip Lawrenson at the Tate. Um, also the Variable Media Network at the Guggenheim, the Museum of Martin Art in New York has a, a whole um, symposium workshop that they lead about this question because, as you know, Jean was suggesting, you, you basically have to work with the artist to isolate what is the work of art. Is it simply the object that results? Is it the code? Um, you know, there's this great myth about digital that digital is totally immaterial and you know, it lasts forever, but the reality is, is that that information is encoded in software programs and is stored on hardware systems that both can become obsolete and inaccessible. Um, anybody who has you know, memories of like floppy disks or has you know, homework from sixth grade somewhere <laughs> that's saved to a CD-ROM that can no longer be played, um, that was a very specific example, so you probably know that it was not uh, an abstract one. Um, so, you know, that digital is not really this immaterial um, and, you know, uh, infinitely lasting material that it, that it really needs to be treated. Uh, and it has conservation needs that are very specific to it that require a lot of time and energy and thoughtful consideration. So it's something that we're all working on right now in the field. I may just add one thing. It might be one deterrent for collectors, in the sense that you know this difficulty of preserving the work. Um, I know that now museums are more inclined to purchase or acquire that kind of works, <clears throat> but still, uh, it's a bit of a break <laughs> uh, when it comes to you know sometimes you have to pay quite a sum of money to acquire a work. And the um, uh, fact that it is very difficult and costly to preserve on the long uh, term uh, sometimes block uh, a bit the fervor yeah. of... Uh, I, I understand that, but I, I, my retort is always, it also costs a lot of money to store a painting forever to keep it climate controlled. So I think that the real answer is not that it's necessarily more expensive, it's just that it's more foreign and we, there's a kind of anxiety because we're not comfortable, we're not familiar with what it means to store a piece of software, whereas we know exactly what it costs to store a, a work of oil on canvas. So, But these are exciting issues that we're gonna be continuing to deal with in the future. Um, so at this point, I think we'll probably end it here, but if anybody has any more questions, come up and, and talk to us. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you so much to, again, Agak, and we'll take it afterwards, to, to Agak and Papier for having us. So thank you so much.